So in this next part, we're going to be creating a damageable component, which will allow a character like the player or the knight enemy to take damage. So we'll need a method which allows us to take damage by a certain amount. And we'll be able to set up a death trigger on the player and the knight. We are going to have to make sure that the death transition cannot transition into itself. We'll talk about more about that in a bit. And we can create a custom state behavior to fade a character out when it reaches the death state. So to start working on our damageable character component, let's open up the player prefab and add a new component to the bottom. So this will be a new custom script. I will call it damageable. And let's hit enter and create an add. So at the start of this script, I'm going to start by creating two properties. One is going to be public float max health, which will create a basic getter and setter function for. So get is going to return underscore max health and then set is going to set that max health variable. So the reason for having a field for the max health property is just so that we can show it in the inspector and edit it for each of our characters. So private float underscore max health. And we're going to add serialize field to this. And then our second property is actually going to set a an, and then our second property is going to set a animator parameter as well. So let's start by creating the field private float underscore health and uh, we can default this to 100 we can also default the max health to 100 as the automatic value for any damageable character and then let's create the public property public float health so our get function is just going to return underscore health and then the set function is going to take the health and set it to a value but if the health drops below zero the character is no longer alive so if the new health is below zero, we can set a third property is alive to false. So let's generate this property as well. Private pool is alive, uh, which is actually going to default to true by default, of course. We'll return is alive and the setter is going to set the is alive field. But we're also going to set the parameter on the animator is alive as a Boolean to whatever this is alive value is. So let's get reference to the animator, just like other scripts, animator, animator. And then down here below the properties, we'll do void awake. And then animator equals get component animator. So now that we have that, we can do animator set bool and we'll do animation strings dot is alive, which we haven't created yet. And we'll set that to whatever the new value is. Okay, and let's uh, make that lowercase. So it's just a field, not a property. And let's jump into animation strings. So I accidentally created it as a property. So I'm just going to rename it to be a static string is alive equals is alive. Now, while we're at it, we should take these animation strings and copy them into our animators for both the knight and the player. So let's click on the player, go to animator, add a Boolean, paste in is alive. Let's go back out, find the prefab for the knight, add a parameter is alive. While we're at it, we can also take the knight and we'll add in the damageable component since it's going to be a damageable character. And there we can see our max health. We should also be able to see our uh, we should also be able to see our current health. So we have to serialize that field. So let's go back to damageable and make sure that these fields are serialized, both is alive and the health. OK, next, I'm going to get rid of the start update methods and let's go ahead and create a new function public void hit which is actually going to take a int damage value. So using an integer means there's no decimal points, of course. If you don't want to be able to take decimal point damage for your game and there's no reason to have, let's say, like 5.5 hit points, you can actually take these fields up here and just make them floats instead, which is what I did in the original. So I'm going to change all of these floats to integers. So we're only going to be dealing with whole numbers. So whenever a character is about to be hit, I want to check if the character is alive before applying damage. So a dead character can't take any more damage. But I also want to check if the character is currently invincible. So I want to do and and is not invincible, which we'll set up in a second here. And then we can start by applying the damage. So health minus equals damage. So is invincible. Let's generate that field up here. And what we're going to do is whenever the character gets hit, there'll be a certain period of time where the character cannot be hit again. So by default, this will be false. If we want to see it in the inspector, then we could also serialize it. So to make the character invincible, 
we simply come down here and set is invincible to true. But currently this would mean that the character will never be able to be hit again. So we'll need to have a timer going so that after a certain amount of time, the character is able to be hit again. So we are actually going to need the update method after all. So we'll do public void update. And if the character is currently invincible, we're going to run the timer. So first we'll check if time sense hit is greater than invincibility timer. If that's the case, we'll remove the invincibility. So is invincible equals false. And we'll also set time sense hit to zero, which means we're going to reset the timer. So to make the timer increment, we need to do time sense hit plus equals time dot dot time, which is the time between frames. And now we need to actually generate these fields. So I'm going to generate the variable time sense hit. And uh, instead of invincibility timer, let's call it invincibility time. So let's generate that as well. Okay, so these are saying int, but I want to retype those to float. Since you definitely can have a fraction of a second, it definitely makes sense to use float here. So the invincibility time by default, let's say it's something like 0 0.25 seconds. And then the time since hit is going to start at zero. So this invincibility time, I would want to customize that in the inspector. So let's just make this a public float invincibility time. And then you can customize how long a character should be able to be invincible between hits for. So that is pretty much setting up the is invincible. So now let's test all of this by seeing if we can make the character die. So I'll take is alive and let's print out a debug value where if is alive is set, we'll print out what value it was set to, which will tell us if the character is registering as dead or alive. So in the update, let's run the hit function and I'll take 10 damage at a time. So pass in 10 as the argument. And if this ran on every frame and was able to actually hit the character, then it would take an incredibly small amount of time for the character to actually die. But with a 0 0.25 second invincibility time, that should mean 10 hits times 0 0.25 seconds. So you'd be looking at 2.5 seconds. So we'll see if the character basically dies instantly or in 2.5 seconds. So let's go to the game, uh, out to the main scene. We'll hit play. And let's see how long this takes. So nothing's happening. And there we can see both characters is alive was set to false. So the reason it showed up twice is because it's both the player and the knight enemy, both using the same script with the same settings. So that's why we got two messages. So the last thing we're going to want to do for the video is to be able to transition to the death state for both our player and the knight. So I'm going to take this any state and I'm going to make a transition to knight death. And the condition for this is going to be that is alive is set to false. So for the transition, there'll be no transition duration and no has exit time. So as you can see, is alive is set to false by default. So make sure you check that in the parameters. So let's go ahead back in the game, hit play and test things out. So we're watching the night enemy and you can see is alive gets set to false and we enter the night death state. But you can see a major problem here, which is that the animation isn't playing. And the reason for that is that when you have an any state connection to a animation state is that when you have any state connected to a animation state is that when you have any state connected to an animation state and those conditions are met, it will keep trying to go to those conditions. So you could use a trigger that the is alive was set to false as a one time off thing. But because we're using a Boolean here, what we need to do is to go into the settings for this transition and uncheck can transition into self. So once the character is in this death animation, it will only play one. Then it can no longer re-enter the death animation unless you're in a different state at that point. So if we hit play, then you'll see the death animation actually plays now and the character will be stuck in that death state, which is what we're actually looking for. So now likewise, we'd want to have something very similar added to the player. So I don't believe we've created the death animation for the player. So in the list of animations, we're going to want to create a new clip. So let's do player death and we'll put it in characters player and save it inside of here. So 10 samples per second. We go to projects, art, RV Ross adventurer, individual sprites and find the die animations. So this is seven frames. We drag them all in, hit play. And this will be a one time thing, not a loop. So we got to find the animation and turn off looping. So let's see, play a death, inspector, turn off loop. OK, 
Okay, now back in the animator for the player, we'll see the animation is already added here. So we can do the same thing. Any state, transition to player death. With the transition, turn off the transition duration. Turn off can transition to self. And for the condition, uh, we're going to need to choose is alive, is true. And so that should basically give us the same result as with the knight. So let's see if they both play. Okay, this animation did not. So also for the player, make sure that you check is alive at the start. Now let's go ahead and hit play. So is alive needs to be false as the condition and make sure that is alive defaults to true over here. Now let's hit play and see what happens after 2.5 seconds. Okay, so we get the death animation for both characters. That's what we're looking for. Now you can see one problem here, which is that this character is still able to move even though he's in the death state. So let's take player death, add a behavior, set bool behavior, can move, update on state, value on enter is off. And I'm also going to leave value on exit to off. It should never technically exit the death state, but let's not re-enable it for no reason. And as you can see on night enemy, we already set that up before. So let's hit play one more time and test it. So we're in that state and we can no longer move, but we can swap left and right for our direction. So let's add in one more condition on our player controller script. So let's go to player controller and let's use one more property. We could add a reference to the damageable component here, or we could just get the property off of the animator. In this case, I'll get the property off of the animator. So public bool is alive and we'll have a git return animator dot git bool animation strings is alive. This way we just don't need to directly depend on the damageable component uh, for the script to work as long as something setting that is alive variable. So with this is alive boolean we can go down to on move and we can check if the character is alive before we set is moving to be equal to this and allowing the facing direction to be set. So let's just cut that paste that in there. So I can also do an else if the character is not alive, it's not moving. So we'll do is moving is false just for the sake of completion. So let's do one more quick test inside of the game. So in our normal states, the player can move and flip directions. But when the character is now in the death state, can no longer flip the direction or move. So that's what we're looking for. The last thing for this video is that when one of the enemies dies, that we want to fade it out of the game and then remove its game object. So we can create that as a state behavior that we can throw on any state or a state machine. But generally, we'll just use that with the night death animation. So I'm going to add a new behavior script and I will call it fade remove behavior. New script, create an add. So we're going to need on state enter and on state update as our override methods. So let's go ahead and uncomment those. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take the color of the sprite renderer and we're going to remove its alpha until it reaches zero. And the speed we're going to be doing that is going to be dependent on a timer. When the timer is up, we'll remove the game object from the scene. So up at the top, we're going to need a public float, which is going to be fade time. And I'll default that to, let's say, 0.5 seconds. Since it's public, we can edit it in the inspector if we need to. Then we'll need a private float, and I'll call it time elapsed. Of course, this will default to zero. We'll also need to find the sprite renderer so that we can set the color on this sprite. And let's get the game object obj to remove. So when we enter the state, we want to start the timer. So time elapsed, we will make sure that that is zero. The sprite renderer. We'll get that from the animator's game object. So animator dot get component sprite renderer and then obj to remove. I guess we could just do animator dot get component game object, but a quicker way would probably just be animator dot game object. Now on state update, we'll do time elapsed plus equals time dot delta time. If the time elapsed is greater than the fade time, then we're going to destroy the object to remove. So something we're going to want to get out of the sprite render and cache up here at the start is going to be the starting color. So let's do a color start color. And once we have reference to the sprite renderer, we can get that from the sprite renderer. So start color equals sprite render dot color. So on every update, we want to update the sprite renderer's color, removing the alpha as we approach a zero alpha or complete invisibility. And then that's when we remove the game object. So we want to do sprite renderer.color. It's going to be equal to a new color, 
which is going to be start color dot red or R, comma start color dot G for green, start color dot B for blue, as the RGB values. But then the fourth value alpha is going to be a calculation. So I'll create a variable called new alpha and let's do float new alpha and we'll calculate that here. Okay, so the formula here is one minus time elapsed divided by fade time. So how this works at the start is the order of operations is going to do the division first, time elapsed divided by fade time. If it helps make it clear, we can wrap it in parentheses, but that's not necessary. So whatever percentage the time elapsed is out of the fade time, we're going to subtract that from a full alpha value of one. So if time elapsed is 50% of the fade time, then it's going to be one minus 50% and our new alpha is going to be 50%. But to finish this off, I actually want to take the starting alpha and multiply that by this. So let's do start color dot a times whatever the results of all of this is. So if the color on the sprite renderer enters into this state with a alpha value of one, nothing changes. But if the alpha value is below one, because you wanted to have a partially transparent character, for instance, then we're going to be adjusting the new alpha value by a percentage of that. So if we started at 50% and this comes out to 50%, then the new value is 25%. But if this is 50% and this is one, then the new value is 50%. So we set the new alpha down here on the color every frame. And then once the time elapses, we destroy the game object. Okay, so as you can see on the inspector for that state, the only thing we really need to set up here is the fade time. So how long you want to take for the object to completely fade to invisibility and remove itself from the scene. So let's hit play and test it. So when we get to the death state, you can see the knight not only plays his animation, but he also fades out. And if you look in the hierarchy of the scene is completely removed from the game. So I'm not applying this to the player. I would probably presume that when the player dies, you'd have a game over screen or something like that, rather than removing the player completely. But you could also apply the same script to the player if you wanted to.